This is the Proton Guru video practice for topics 3.3 through 5. These problems will give you practice on applying electrophilic addition and carbocation rearrangement and applying Markovnikov's role in the context of hydrohalogenation and hydration of alkene. Some brief and straightforward reading to get you ready for these kinds of problems can be found in the Organic Chemistry 1 Primer 2018 in lessons 3.3 through 5. You can also find additional chemistry videos and information on how to match the videos to your particular course's textbook to help you out with that course at ProtonGuru.com. So our first question is asking us to provide the arrow pushing reaction mechanism for this reaction. There's an important point that applies to a lot of the alkene reactions we'll learn, and that is that CC double bonds in an arene do not react the same way as in a regular alkene. That's why we call them two different functional groups. So we'll keep that in mind as we work these problems. First thing we have to ask ourselves is, well, what kind of reaction is this? You look at the functional groups, and the reactions we know are reactions of alkenes. There are no leaving groups or alcohols for other types of reactions we've seen. So we say we've got an alkene, and this other reagent, hydrobromic acid, is a strong acid. Whenever you see that combination, you should be thinking about a two-step process where you have electrophilic addition followed by coordination of a nucleophile. Now remember the electrophilic addition will lead to the formation of a carbocation. You've got to check to see if that carbocation will rearrange any time you make a carbocation intermediate. And with all reactions, you've got to check the stereochemistry, see if you have any chiral centers at the end of the reaction. So if we've identified that we think it's going to be an electrophilic addition followed by coordination, we figure out what the electrophile is. Well, a strong acid will dissociate into a proton, which is a great electrophile, and a bromide, which is a good nucleophile. This is lucky because we need a good nucleophile for the coordination step. So first things first, what is the product of that electrophilic addition step? We're going to add the hydrogen to one of those two sides. The other carbon will be left with only three bonds, and therefore it'll have a positive charge. Well, which side should get the positive charge, the primary or the secondary? Generally, you want to make, as the major pathway, the more stable carbocation. So you'll have a secondary carbocation in this case. Now you always check to see whether that carbocation will rearrange. You do that by looking beside the site where you currently have the carbocation. Our current carbocation is secondary. It won't become any more stable by moving primary or secondary to the carbons beside it. So in this case, it won't rearrange. And then we can simply do our coordination step. Coordination is simply the pushing of electrons from the bromide to share with the carbon that has the positive charge that will make a fourth bond to the carbon. The last thing we need to do is check for stereocenters. We see that we have a chiral center here. Is it going to be just R, or is it going to be just S, or it will be some mixture? We have to figure that out. Remember the general rule is you can't start with a chiral starting materials or intermediates and get one specific isomer, so we have to have a mixture of the two possible R and S isomers there. They should form an equal amount, so we have a racemic mixture. Notice then the net result of this reaction. The net result is that you added another hydrogen here and a bromine here. This is what is known as the Markovnikov addition product. The Markovnikov product is one in which the more electronegative atom ends up on the more substituted carbon. In this case, you added a Br to this carbon and an H to this carbon. Bromine's the more electronegative, so this is the Markovnikov product. Next, we have the same type of question, but with different reagents. And again, we have an alkene reacting with a strong acid, sulfuric acid. There's also water present. So we would think of the same reaction sequence. Electrophilic addition, make the carbocation, check to see if it rearranges, then coordinate that nucleophile. Finally, at the end, check for stereocenters. So if we set up how this should look, we know that the strong acid dissociates, and the conjugate base of sulfuric acid is not a good nucleophile. It's too bulky. But water can be used as a nucleophile, and that's what we'll do in this case. This is a hydration reaction. So just as in our previous problem, arrow pushing is electrophilic addition of the pi bond to that proton. We want to put the positive charge on the secondary, not the primary carbon, as our major pathway. That's the more stable. Now we've got to check to see if it rearranges. It's already secondary. If we moved it here to be secondary, it's not any more stable. This side would be primary, so it's not going to rearrange in this case either. Now we need to do our coordination. This is a neutral nucleophile. It's going to donate its lone pair, but in order to prevent the oxygen from getting a positive charge, you're going to have to deprotonate at the same time. That's how we get to our final product. Well, now we have to check for stereocenters. 
This is a stereocenter that existed from the start of the reaction, but we didn't make or break any bonds to the stereogenic carbon there, so that's going to be maintained throughout the reaction. It retains the stereochemistry. But this site was achiral in the starting material, achiral in the intermediate. Now it's a stereogenic center. We should have a mixture of R and S at that position. So the major product would be a mixture of actually two diastereomers. A mixture of two diastereomers, remember, is not referred to as a racemic mixture. The definition of a racemic mixture is a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. And in terms of regioselectivity, that is, which region or which atom in the molecule gets attached to the oxygen, which gets attached to the H, we see the proton attached to the less substituted side and the oxygen attached to the more substituted side. So just like in our previous example, this is a Markovnikov addition as the major product. So here's a similar problem. Arrow pushing mechanism leading to the major product for this reaction. It's again an alkene with a strong acid, so we're going to follow our same sort of procedures for the previous two problems. We set this up and say, well, it's going to do electrophilic addition first. Our strong acid has dissociated, so the arrow pushing for electrophilic addition step looks like that. Making sure we form the carbocation where the positive charge is on that secondary carbon, not on this primary carbon. We've got that here. And now we need to check to see whether that carbocation rearranges. It's secondary. It won't get any more stable by going primary. That's less stable. But look over here. That's a tertiary carbon. So we need to do the carbocation rearrangement. So let's readjust our scheme and say, okay, electrophilic addition, but we need to do carbocation rearrangement before we can do the coordination. And the carbocation rearrangement arrow pushing will look like this. You've got to move these two electrons with the hydrogen over to this carbon so that now that carbon is neutral. It's got four bonds. That'll leave this carbon that used to have four bonds from the beginning with only three. That's how we know it's the positive charge. Now it's tertiary and it's more stable. Only then are we ready to do the coordination. So coordination of the iodide, which we've identified as our nucleophile from the first step, leads to the formation of this product. And now we check that for stereocenters. Well, this is an achiral compound because although we have an iodide and an ethyl on this carbon, this side of the ring and this side of the ring are identical to one another. So our final product is achiral. As we learn more and more reactions, we can string these together into longer and longer reaction sequences. A good strategy when you're faced with a task like this is to think about, well, what kind of reaction is each individual step? Some of the steps are really unique. If we're starting with an epoxide like this for the first step, let's say, we know we're doing a ring opening. Look at this second step and take some notes on our exam or quiz, whatever we're working on. This is a very specific reagent used to convert an OH to a Cl group, and in this case it's going to operate by an SN2 pathway. So we're going to get some type of chloride here. If this reagent converts an OH to a chloride, well, there must be an alcohol in this box. So we're just sort of taking notes here before we figure out the specific structures. So we have some sort of chloride attached to something. Then we look at this reagent. Well, this is a strong base and a very poor nucleophile, so we think that's the best type of reagent for an E2 reaction. Probably get some sort of alkene here. If we know this box is going to have some sort of alkene, then when we look at these reagents, we can say, well, sulfuric acid and water, one of the examples we just did a couple pages ago, that's going to add an OH and an H to either side of that CC double bond. It's going to try to form the Markovnikov product, and one important thing to look out for, got to see if that carbocation rearranges in the course of the reaction. Phosphorus tribromide, another unique reagent that is used to convert an OH to BR. So whatever's in this box must be an OH. That's consistent with the analysis we just did for this step, saying we should add an OH to the alkene. And this step doesn't look super familiar. It's not something that stands out. We better draw this out and look at it more when we get to that step. So that's sort of the thought process looking at this. I know I'm going to have an alcohol in this box, a chlorine in this box, an alkene in this box, an alcohol in this box, and a bromide in this box. So let's look through and figure out the specific structures one box at a time. Well, if I have ring opening, I need a nucleophile. So I identify this ionic compound here. My nucleophilic species is going to attack that carbon and open the ring up. Second step is simply to put an H on the oxygen. So if I break that side of the ring open and put an H on the oxygen, this bond is gone that used to be in the epoxide, and I have this intermediate species. Next, I convert the OH to a Cl, as I said in my thought process here. And it's an SN2 process, so we're going to have to look at the stereochemistry and invert it. Next, we have what we thought 
might do an E2 reaction. And a good leaving group on a secondary carbon is certainly a good substrate for an E2 reaction. So we make sure that we make the Zaitsev product, we make the most stable alkene we can by taking the H off of a more substituted carbon adjacent to the chlorine, not this methyl group attached to the leaving group carbon. And we make sure it's the trans isomer, so that would be this alkene here. And now the reaction we're learning brand new in this topic is hydration reaction where you add an H and an OH Markovnikov. So you think about, it doesn't matter which of these two carbons I make the positive charge on because you'll get the same carbocation either way, it's secondary. This one won't rearrange because you don't see a more substituted site beside the secondary carbocation. That site will then just get the OH. So you put that on there and you have to realize that this is a stereogenic carbon right here, it's a chiral center but you start with achiral reagents and starting materials. So that's going to be a racemic mixture. The instructions are telling you though to keep only the R isomer. So if you sat down and figured it out, you would know the R isomer is the one where this was a wedge. The next step is to change the OH to a bromine using phosphorus tribromide. That's an SN2 pathway, so we're going to have to invert that R isomer to what is now the S isomer. Now as we thought through all these steps, we sort of skipped this one and said, well, we'll draw this one out later because it doesn't really stand out as a real familiar reagent. So if you dissociate the Na plus from this O minus and draw out the Lewis structure, you see it looks like this. And you see that it has resonant stabilization, so it's a weak base, but it's still a good nucleophile. A weak base slash good nucleophile reacting with a secondary carbon with a good leaving group, that will be favoring an SN2 pathway. So we put the nucleophile on, it's the O minus that's the nucleophilic site. And remember that you have Walden inversion with an SN2 reaction, so go from the hash line to the wedge line. Another type of question might show you the products and instead ask you to fill in the missing reactants or reagents that would lead to the provided products. For each step, think about, well, what is happening? And look at the first step. In this step, we can see the ring is opening because this bond that used to be here is gone. We have to add a hydrogen to this carbon, right? This carbon had one hydrogen on it, but if it's neutral in this product, it has two. So we need to add a hydrogen. So we need some sort of H minus nucleophile. We also have to add a hydrogen to the oxygen. Remember that when that happens in a ring opening of an epoxide, you usually would add the nucleophile in step one and add a proton source in step two. So if these are what we need, we need a salt of H minus and then some proton source. That will get us to this as the major product. This second step requires us to eliminate the OH from this carbon, eliminate one of the hydrogens from this carbon, and make a double bond here. That is an E1 or E2 reaction. But remember that the E2 reaction doesn't happen with alcohols. You need an acid to activate that OH to be a good leaving group. It's the E1 reaction that will do that. And we learned that sulfuric acid would be the way to accomplish an E1 from an alcohol. Well, what's happening in this next case? We are adding a hydrogen to this carbon, and we're adding a chlorine to that carbon. So we're adding an H into Cl to an alkene. That matches some of the problems we covered earlier in this video. You just need a strong acid so that you can do electrophilic addition of the H, get that one on there, and then coordination of the Cl, get that one on there. Well, the next step is kind of interesting because it's showing that you get two products, not just one. So you're substituting a chloro for an OH, that's how you get one of the products. To get the other product, you actually eliminate the chlorine from the molecule, and you eliminate one of these two hydrogens, and you make a double bond here. That's how you would get to this product here. Well, substitution could be SN1 or SN2, but look at this carbon, it's tertiary, and SN2 doesn't work on tertiary, whereas SN1 is really good on tertiary carbons. So we're probably going to have to use a mixture of E1 and SN1 because this is tertiary. So we need a weak base, poor nucleophile to accomplish that. The nucleophile has to supply an OH. So water and heat would be the way to get a mixture of E1 and SN1. Now the instructions say that as you do this reaction, this product bubbles out as a gas at that reaction temperature. The alcohol is a much higher boiling point because it's hydrogen bonding, so it stays in your flask and they say you're going to use this in your next step. Well, all that's happening in the next step is you're changing this OH into a tosyl group. The way you accomplish that is with tosyl chloride and pyridine. 